you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you who are, have committed to support me and those who are going to commit to support me. I'm so excited. Yesterday, counted all my yard sale money, and I made $512.28. Thank you. Woo! What a blessing. And I want to especially thank Fred, who not only hauled tables, he set them up, he helped haul out the stuff, he hung signs, he bought water, he took everything back down. So let's give Fred a really hand. Then tomorrow I got Doug and Jerry and uh, John and Chuck coming to help move. And I forgot to ask you, Alan, but Alan's going to help me move on the 15th. (laughs) Um, We're loading stuff in. Doug Laidley's been wonderful and set me up with a um, storage unit, put pallets in there and plywood so it's lifted up so I'm safe. I mean, just taking care of me so good like you guys do. And I just want to tell you all, I have got enough support that the free Methodist part of my mission is supported, and they gave me permission to buy my tickets. So I'm flying out of here October 13th. However, they're considering me three separate things, and so I'm still raising support for the ACE school, the ACE school, because guess what? In Myanmar, and I have enough support to pay rent, but you pay the whole year at once. And I have an American lady who will share with me, but I still have to have 1900 up front because it's only 320 a month, so 100, uh, whatever. I had it, 160, right? Yeah, 160, but times 12. So I have to have a little over 1900 altogether to put down. And then also my third uh, mission is working with those small homes for the uh, orphans to prevent human trafficking of these little kids. And to be able to get up to those villages up in the mountains, I'm going to need more money for transportation, which is not included because, you know, they've made it clear I'm under... Pakep when I'm with our Free Methodist, I'm under Wawa when I'm with ACE, and I'm under Seth when I'm working there. So I do have more to raise, even though I'm going. (laughs) So I just want to thank you all and appreciate those who are still praying about supporting me. I still need your support, but of course, most of all, prayer, prayer, prayer. Thank you. God bless. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 23. This is entitled, The Believer's Prayer. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Our second passage is also in Acts chapter 13. 13 through 39. Acts 13, starting with verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Pergia, they went on to Poseidon, Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, 
Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave the land to these people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Do you think I am? Excuse me, who do you think I am? I am not that one. No, but he is coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that the message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets and that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. There are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has, also, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. I will surely give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere. You will not let your holy one see decay. For when David served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead, he did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want to know that you... Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything. You could not be justified from the law, by the law of Moses. That's our scripture readings. And is there young children this morning? Okay, this is the time to be dismissed for Children's Church. Good morning. How many of you know what a canary flutter is? You ever heard that term? You have because of my mother. So you don't know what that is. You know how a bird gets in a bird bath and splashes water all over them to bathe? Well, that's what I had this morning. So that's why I'm not shaving. And if I smell, I apologize now. Because we have no water or power. So I can't believe you haven't heard that term. That must be a southern thing. (laughs) If you'll bow our heads, we'll start in prayer. Father, we thank you so much today for your word. Father, that you have given us a book that is a guideline for our behavior, Father, that tells stories of your story, Father, which is the title of this message today, that life is a story, but it's not just our story, Father, it's your story. And let us be reminded of that today through your word. Let us take what you would have us to hear and apply it to our lives to bring glory and honor to you. And we thank you, Father. First, in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Today is called Life is a Story. Everyone has a story. You're born, you live a certain amount of time, and then you die inevitably. So you have that much time to write your story. Okay? But what is your story going to be? You see it on tombstones everywhere you go. It says, John Doe born this date, and then there's a dash, and then John Doe died this date. That dash is what he did in his life. It's what your life will say or not. Okay? So I'm going to give you some tips about that. Our story begins when we're born, and we have no say about it. You have no say about the abilities that you're born with, what race you're born into, where you're born into, what economics you're born into, freedom or not free. You have no choice in all that. But very soon, even when you're a tiny little baby, you start making choices. And that's when you get a chance to take the pen and start writing some of the lines in your story. Okay? Everything we do, though has consequences. There are decisions for everything. Consequences may be small or they may be enormous. Take, for example, today. 
we made a decision to come in to the shop to work and take a rag and kind of bathe off. That was the consequence. That was the decision. The consequence was hopefully I don't smell as bad as I could smell. Okay, so there's consequences, but there are consequences too that have major impacts in your life. Whether you decide to follow God, the one true God or not, and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior has eternal consequences. But everything we do writes a story. It has consequences. We make choices all throughout life. Knowing and understanding who the author of life is can make the road of life a lot easier, a lot more blessings. Knowing that God is in control, it is His story that's being written. Because so many times we lose focus of that and we think it's our story. It's our purposes and our desires. God is always in control and God always has a purpose. We may choose to follow Him and go along with His choices and live a life according to that. Or we may decide to live a life that is against that. But guess what? Even if we live a life that's against that, it still brings out His will and His purpose. Take Pontius Pilate, for example. He made a decision to let Jesus be crucified. What a terrible decision to make. But it was still God's will and God's plan. It still was writing God's story. So even someone, whether they knew they were going against God or not going against God, was still writing God's story. It's pretty awesome when you sit back and look at who God is and how much He is in control. Because again, so many times we think that He doesn't hear our prayers. That maybe... He is in control, but he just sits back and doesn't really care. That's not true at all. He has a plan, and he wants you to be part of that plan. And he wants your life to write the same storylines. God has a plan for you. Don't ever forget that. Jeremiah says that before you were even born, that he knew you in your mother's womb. He has plans for you. And those plans are not only plans for you, but plans for you to prosper. So I'm going to go over a story today, what elements are part of a story. And they're basically five parts of a story, five elements. And those elements are characters, setting, plot, conflict, and theme. And I've got a little video we can watch. It has nothing to do with Jesus or Christianity. It's just so that you can hear in your head repetitively in rap that what the elements of the story are. Because if you realize those things again, you can say, well, wait a minute. What is the plot going on here? Oh, and relate that to God's plot. So if we can play that video.
That kind of music, you might not can stand that kind of music, but what are the five elements now? You got it? Plot, character, conflict, theme, setting. Got it? So we're going to discuss those things. Everyone is writing their life's story. Whether you believe it or not, you are through the decisions you make. And plenty of times in life, you've written lines you wish you could take out, haven't you? But you can't. It's written. It's done. If you haven't ever noticed, it's his story. It's history. It's God's story, no matter what you do. Let's look at the example of Solomon that we had. God gave him wisdom, riches, power. What did he write with his story? Foolishness, because he took his eyes off the living God. What did Caleb write with his story? Well, he had a different spirit, as God said, and he loved God wholeheartedly and followed God wholeheartedly. And he wrote a story that glorifies God. And from that, there were blessings, blessings that were passed on to his children also. So we're writing history, his story. Every story has an author. Who's the author of your life? God is the author, whether you realize it or not. Like I said with Pontius Pilate or many other examples. Jesus is, God is in control, and He writes the story. He may not want the decisions that were made by any means, but He still works them out for His plan and His purpose. So the five elements were plot, character, conflict, theme, right? We're going to look at character first. It's the first element of the story that I looked at. Who are the characters in the story of life? God is the primary character, not Alan. Not Jacob, not Squire, not Barry. God is, not Sherry. Sorry, babe. God is the main character. All you've got to do is open up the Bible and start reading from cover to cover. The very first paragraph is what God did, His awesomeness. How He spoke and created things that are beyond our belief. And He did it by verbal word. He spoke and then there was light. He spoke and there was life, complex life, not something that had to evolve. He didn't say that he had to study and plan it out either. He says he spoke. That's all that God had to do. Sometimes we don't realize how great our God is. But he is the author. Second chapter of of Genesis, we read about a character named man. God created man. Man didn't create man. Man didn't create God. And so much today, we get that backwards. God is supposed to be fitting our needs and our wants and our desires. And when He doesn't do it, we think He's not listening. Or maybe He's not even there. But God is writing the story. He breathed life into man. Man is a pivotal character in the story, second one mentioned. And it says that He was created above the other beings and everything to rule over this earth. So man is significant, but man is not the central character of the story. And later in the story, we're introduced to many other characters. Um, Man has a companion, Eve. And soon, very soon, we see Satan creep into the story, another major character in the story. So characters are an important part of the story. But again, all of the characters reflect something about the main character. Good or bad, your actions reflect about the hero of the story, the character. And like I said, even bad characters show how good God's greatness is. The second um, plot, of, excuse me, the second element of a story um, that we're going to go into is setting. So where is the setting? Well, God has no setting. He has no beginning or end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. But our setting is God created earth. He put man in it. He let man rule over Okay, but with his guidance and direction. He gave man one simple task because the creation that God made was perfect. He gave us a perfect environment. He made animals and stuff for our enjoyment. He made mountains and seas for our enjoyment. He didn't they weren't an afterthought. He created an environment that man could be in and it'd be perfect. But we had one restriction and that was not to touch or eat the fruit. And we did. We weren't satisfied. We wanted to be in control. We wanted to be the main character. We might not have realized it. We might have realized it. I don't know what their motives were. They might have just been coerced by Satan. Yeah, I don't know. But I know you and I are the same way. We want what we want. And especially being Americans, we want it now. 
I've got a cell phone. I can find out right this second. I want it now. So the setting is the earth, period, for our story. But there are elements of the story that we haven't looked at yet. Don't forget, God is the author, and He alone is writing this story. He is the main character. He created the setting in which the story takes place. It's His story. We can add to it. We can take away from it. But it's still going to be His story. So a story has characters and a story has settings. The plot is the next element of the story. Well, now here's where it gets interesting. So what is the plot of this story that you read? Sometimes it takes you a long time to get into the story to see what the plot really is. You wonder which way the story is going. God is clear. He wants to be found by us. We just have to search for Him. We have to take all the other barriers away and search for Him, put our eyes on Him. By the third chapter, we we get the plot if we don't get it before then. God chose to create us. God chose to have a relationship with an insignificant thing that He created, man. We didn't choose God. He chose us. Don't ever forget that. He wanted a relationship with us. And even through pain, trouble, other things, conflict, which we'll find out, He still pursued us passionately. He wanted a relationship with us. What can we provide Him? Nothing. But he wanted us. That is so awesome. A being of that magnitude wanted a relationship with us. Plot, plain and simple, is he wants a relationship with his children. He chose to have that relationship. So you've got characters, setting, plot. Then you have conflict. What did Solomon do when conflict came in? When he was balancing out, well, what's more important? Being a good ruler having many things, or following God. He chose wisely because he focused here. He forgot to look here. He started with, God, I am your humble servant. I don't know how to lead your people. I need wisdom to do that. And God was pleased and gave him wisdom and so much more. But then he focused over here. Caleb, on the other hand, focused on God wholeheartedly. What did he say when the world stood up against him, when people wanted to kill him? My God can do this. I'm not turning my eyes from my God. But there's giants in the land. and They'll destroy us. God said He'd give us the land. That's what He promises. Caleb stayed wholeheartedly focused on God. That's the story that he wrote. So he followed God's plot. Conflict. Satan comes into the story. What's his purpose? Don't ever forget, he has one purpose only. Don't be fooled. Don't think you can handle what he throws at you. He's been doing it for years and years and years. You don't stand a chance. If the wisest man ever could not stand a chance, how do you think you can? But the great thing is, is you don't have to. If you just focus on God like Caleb did, God will take care of it for you. You can be weak, therefore God is strong. Showing again the power and might of the main character. We have conflict. It makes the story interesting if you're reading a book. And this story, I don't know if it makes it interesting, but interesting is a good word, but it makes life hard, doesn't it? It makes it tough. It makes you write a lot of lines that you wish you hadn't wrote. But again, if you'll learn to focus on the main character, and remember, it is his story, it'll definitely help. Satan wants to deceive you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to turn you from God so that you won't have blessings on this earth the way that you should have. And so that he can rob you from eternal blessings of being with God for all eternity. If you listen to his biggest deception and do not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will spend an eternity away from God the Father, his love, his blessings, everything that is good, pure and righteous. Because Satan is the opposite of that. It can't be there. There will be no relief, no comfort, only pain and suffering if you follow Satan's lies. And in this world, you'll miss out on so many of the blessings that God wants. He wanted a relationship with you. You're His child. He created you. Created a perfect environment. Put you in it. Because He simply wanted a relationship with you. That's just so awesome. And Satan wants to destroy that. And when you rebel and you turn away from God and you focus on other things, plain and simple, that's sin. Sin separates us from God. And then we're hopeless. We have no hope. 
So what is the outcome of the story going to be now that conflicts come in and we've sinned and everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard? Where is this story headed? It's heading to a tragedy rather than a love story, isn't it? But God has a theme. We haven't got there yet. So we've got characters, setting, plot, and conflict. Now theme. It's a central idea or purpose of the story. And God makes it clear. You don't have to read on page after page after page to see what's going on in this story, what the theme is. The theme is even though we break the relationship by sinning, God still wants us back. And He loves us enough that He would send His Son to die for our sins because we cannot do it on our own. Only Jesus Christ was sinless. Only Jesus Christ can take that punishment for us. The punishment which we deserve, which is eternal death and damnation. But Jesus, who was righteous, took our place for us. He burdened everyone's sin for all times. The people that you find just despicable in history and everything, He bore all their sins on them. There was not one person that He said, Oh, wait a minute, they weren't good enough. They were too evil. They were too bad. He died for everyone. And He said as He was dying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's how much God's love is for you. But you have to write your story. You have to make your choices in conjunction with His. He is the character. His story will prevail, not yours. No matter how much you think you have power or might or riches or wisdom or anything else, just like Solomon. When his life was over, he said, the things that I chased were meaningless. And he had more than any of us will ever attain. So the theme of the story, plain and simple, is reconciliation through Jesus Christ our Lord. God loves you. He loves everyone. Even that person that you find unlovable, that you say, well, I'm not going to go talk to this person about Jesus. They can't stand me. I can't stand them. Well, Jesus died for them. You're not better than Jesus. God sent His only Son to die for our sins that we might be restored to a perfect, loving relationship with Him. So do you have a different spirit like Caleb and do you follow him wholeheartedly? Or do you take your eyes off and do you follow him half-heartedly? Jesus is clear about that too. He says he spits out the people that are half-hearted. That he will say to them, I do not know you. It's clear. All you've got to do is pick it up and read it. This is not a story that you've got to figure out what's going on. God lets you know because he wants to have a relationship with you. So plot, character, conflict, theme, what have we missed? We got them all. Plot. (coughs) What was the plot? That Jesus wants a relationship with you. Setting. You can get that one. Earth. Because we don't have have abilities to go beyond that setting. Who's the characters? God's the main character, but we're all characters in writing lines of our own story that make up history. His story. So plot character we got conflict what's the conflict satan and your sinful desires not just satan okay and in theme that he wants reconciliation through jesus christ now if you understand that see how the story comes a little bit better so as you're reading you say wait a minute i understand what's going on reveal it to me god i understand your plan i want to go along with it or i don't I don't accept it. The choice is yours. And the consequences are yours. In Acts chapter 4, 23 through 31, we'll look at that again. It was entitled, The Believer's Prayer. Peter and John were just in prison because they had started preaching about Jesus boldly. And these are people that denied Him just previously and said, we don't know that man because they were scared for their lives. Well, what changes that except they knew now They saw Jesus arise from the dead. They saw Jesus personally. And they boldly preached. First thing happens, they get put in jail. They get threatened. And what do they do when they come out? On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And I'm sure it wasn't nice. They told them to stop or they would kill them. And that's what did result. Most of them lost their lives. When they heard this, they raised their voices... So they spoke boldly together in prayer to God. 
talking to who they knew that was in control, whose story that it was. Sovereign Lord, who was in control. You made the heaven, you did, and the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do nations rage and people plot in you, against you in vain? Why do they? It's meaningless. If you do, God's story is still going to come out. And if you look back at your own life, you can see that. You didn't see it now, then, but you can look at it and see now, wait a minute, God was really working in my life, wasn't He? Even at my lowest times, He pulled me through that. He saved my marriage. He did this, He did that, whatever it might be. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will... Didn't know it, did they? But they did. That your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. <clears throat> now, Lord... Consider their threats and enable your servants. They're deciding to write their story in conjunction with God's story. <clears throat> your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They had just been imprisoned, threatened with their lives. They could have went off and we not heard anything about them and we wouldn't have thought any less. But they knew the truth. They knew whose story it was. So they prayed to speak the words with great boldness. And then they acknowledged where that comes from. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they play, prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly just like they asked faithfully. God was faithful to give to them because they were following him wholeheartedly. Peter and John knew that God was the author of everything. They knew that He was in control. Yes, they got to see Jesus personally. But you can see Jesus work personally in your lives. Don't ever think you can. All you've got to do is sit back from a different perspective like God does and see all the work that He does. Yes, terrible things happen in this earth. We're not going to change that because we sinned. And sin brought in contamination into His um, creation, And it's going to be that way. You may not like it. I don't like it. No one does. But God is still working through all that. He has a purpose. And that theme is to restore us back to a loving, perfect relationship with Him. And that can only be done through Jesus Christ. What about Paul? We read about Paul also in Acts 13. This is really the first sermon that we hear about from Paul. Paul, he was a stubborn guy. He didn't want to write his story along with God's. He wanted to persecute Christians. He wanted to kill them. He wanted to have nothing to do with God. He wanted to write a story, this insignificant man, against God. And what happened? God let him know. He said, uh, excuse me, I'm in control. And Paul spoke boldly from there on and spread the gospel message stronger than probably any of the other disciples. He got a taste of of how awesome and how powerful God is. And he didn't worry about anything else. He knew that this was not his life, that it was God's. He knew that it was a race. He knew that it was a battle. There's so many things that I can give you examples that he says. So in Acts 13, <clears throat> this is his first sermon that we hear about. Listen to how much he gives God the credit. It's so awesome if you read it this way. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia. Excuse me a second while I get some water. My throat's crackling. Mm -hmm. Where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga they went on to Poseidon Antioch. On the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law of the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them saying, <coughs> Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. That means listen. Okay, what are the five elements of the story again? Plot, character, conflict, theme, setting. Okay, and you got them? Listen. 
The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. God chose. They didn't choose Him. God chose them. And that's obvious if you read about their history. Because every time they had a chance, they turned their back on God. But guess what? He was still faithful and followed everything that He had promised them. God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper, tearing their slavery in Egypt. With mighty power, He led them out of captivity. Verse 18, He endured their conduct. That's pretty tough to swallow because they did not have very good conduct. For about 40 years in the desert, He overthrew seven nations in Canaan, and He gave their land to His people as their inheritance, as He promised. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges because they asked. Then the people asked for a king. He gave them a king. I'm in verse 21. Sorry. Which was Saul of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After he removed Saul, Saul lost his focus. Saul did not follow him wholeheartedly. He removed Saul as a result. He made David the king. He made David. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And we know the things that David did. He didn't really look like a man after God's own heart with the actions that he did. But guess what? God saw his heart, his wholehearted heart. And that's such a great example. Because you can see that no matter what you've done, no matter what you ever will do, because David did some pretty nasty things, that God still loved him. And not only loved him, it called him a man after his own heart. God loves those who love him regardless of the things that they do. He wants to take them back. <clears throat> he will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to, to Israel the Savior Jesus, just as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. And some thought that John was the coming Messiah. So he made it clear. As John was completing his work, work he said, Who do you think I am? Bringing the focus, the pivotal point of all of his story, history, in Jesus Christ. And it is a pivotal point of all history. You cannot deny it. Reconciliation given to man again. Wow. From a loving, awesome God. <clears throat> I am not the one. No, but he is coming after me. Whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Verse 26. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. God sent the message of salvation. He loved you enough to created you, create you because He wanted a relationship with you. He loved you enough to send the message of salvation and restore you back to Him, no matter what you've done. <clears throat> 27. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning Him, they fulfilled the words of the prophet, God's story was still told even through non-believers, wasn't it? That's so cool. <clears throat> that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, and they didn't even know it, they took him down from a tree and laid him in a tomb. They thought they were killing Jesus, and they were going right through with all the prophecies and doing exactly what God's story was to be. And they thought they were killing the Messiah. They thought they were killing hope. That's so cool. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses. They write the story for him. We tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers. He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. For when David had served God's purpose, even through all of his actions, he served God's purpose. In his own generation, in his own storyline, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers and his body's his body decayed. 
But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. God's very clear. Through Him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from. You can't do it yourself. The law can't do it. Only God can set the record back straight. But you have a choice to make. You can choose wisely and follow Him wholeheartedly, or you can choose foolishly, follow Him half-heartedly, and fall to idols and Satan's deceptions. Ultimately, if you fall to Satan's ultimate lie, you will not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you will die and spend an eternity apart from Him. But if you do accept Him, then you have eternal life. But don't waste writing your life story. You have so much to write. And the story will be the same regardless because God's writing His story. You're not. You're not the author. You're not the main character. It's not your plot. It's not your theme. You just have to face conflict. And you can't face that conflict alone. But if you face it focusing on God, He will do it for you. And I don't know about you, but my shoulders aren't that big. When I have to face things, especially things that I know that are impossible... I can't handle it. And there's many things that I think I can handle that I can't handle. But God can handle it all. <clears throat> Last Tuesday night, I started writing a sermon for this week. And it was going to be, because it was going to go along with what I had done before, and it flowed pretty nicely before. And I was going to write um, Victory or Defeat. And I sat up from 7 or 8 o'clock, I don't know what time I started, till 2 in the morning, nothing. Went downstairs to get me something to drink. When I hit the bottom of the stairs, I realized, I said, God, I'm so sorry. I was trying to do this by my own might and my own power. I can't do this by my might and my power. Please forgive me. And you write your story, and then bam. So Thursday night when I sat down, it just flowed because I let God do it because I couldn't. You know, I don't have any abilities to stand up here and speak His Word. I just have the love that I have in my heart to tell everyone about Jesus. But only by His might and power can I do it. Let's be clear. God is the author. It's His story. Will you write your storylines according to Him? Or will you try to go against Him? If you do, just like the Scripture said that we read, you're doing it in vain. He's going to write His story anyway. It'd be so much better if you realize that. Realize how great God is. Get to know Him. Follow Him wholeheartedly. He has so many blessings for you. And He wants to restore the relationship that He started. He chose you. and He sent His Son to die for you. Jesus died and that settled it. We don't need anything else. There's no other ways. Salvation can be found in no other name but Jesus Christ. Will you write your storylines in in conjunction with God's story? If you'll bow your heads. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for the story that you have written for us. All the examples that we see. Father, the love that we see poured out, especially on Calvary that you love us so much, that you're not going to let us go easily, but you've still given us free will. It's still our choice. We can choose to follow you wholeheartedly, or we cannot choose. Father, I pray that everyone here is saved. If they don't, Father, I pray that they come to know the salvation of Jesus Christ today, that another day does not pass. And Father, I pray that we follow you wholeheartedly as individuals and as a church, that we make a difference in this world. Father, that we write our storylines to follow yours and we bring you glory and honor. And one day we'll hear you say, well done, my faithful servant. We just thank you for the roadmap that you've given us, the story of your plans for us, your love and your grace through Jesus Christ. And we thank you and praise your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.